So let's jump in. Um, you you probably don't know me, um, but I, I I've I, heard of you. I'm excited to get to know you a little bit better. Okay, so. good. So that's what we're gonna do. This this is I think we communicate similarly, Josh, in that I don't I have no list of questions. I got a blank piece of paper. That's what I do. Um, the first time I think I saw you, I think you shot a video of your dad holding up a sign. Okay, you're smiling. So that is that is. Tell me about that. Well, here's what I want to know, and then you and I can just rap about snowboarding or whatever it is you want to talk about. Um, I think that what I know of you is that you were an originator, maybe. You, you were in the industry. Um, I know you went to U- University of Utah, which we can talk about that in a second as well. But all of a sudden, you shoot this video of your dad, and then it seems like Shred was born from that moment, maybe. Tell me about that. It was am I totally off? What's funny is Shred was born before that. Um, it, that that picture of my dad, he had just retired. Shred had been, we'd been doing Shred for about six months at that point. And uh, so you weren't you weren't originating anymore. No, I was still originating at that point. Okay. Yeah, I was still originating, still had part of our mortgage company. So I still, my background isn't originating. I've been originating for 10 plus years on a mortgage company here in Utah. Um, so I, I mean, I, true blue, like a mortgage originator, love the mortgage industry. Uh, about three years ago, started shred media, just purely, I was actually at an event talking with some executives in the space, talking about, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, talking about some things that are missing from the industry. And a lot of what was missing was, was anybody to help actually create content for big companies. Everybody knows they, they should be utilizing social, social media. Everybody knows they should be creating content, but nobody does it. So like, oh, it'd be nice to have a company that could actually help us create content via this type of medium, like a podcast or a show or whatever. I said, well, oh, I'll start a company doing that. And everybody's like, haha, sure you will. And I did. Like, I love when people like challenge me, like, oh, no, you won't. And I'm like, watch me. So yeah. started Shred Media, started creating content for companies. And that's what it, it just grew from there. And now we... We help some of the biggest fintech companies and lenders, mortgage companies, real estate companies create content uh, via our uh, via our medium, via our platform, and then we create pillar content, micro content. We snip it up in all t- kinds of different formats. But my dad's post is literally he was he was just excited to be retired, and he's like, "Hey, can I come with you to your office?" Because our our office at that time was at one of the busiest intersections in all of Utah. And he's like, I want to stand on the corner, not, not disrespectfully, but I just want to like, what, like wish people a good day. So he wrote on that sign and that, that thing has gone more viral than anything you could like anything I've ever done. Like I still get tagged. People will still message me. And this was, that was, you know, almost three years ago. Now people will message me like, Hey, isn't this your dad? And it will be in some random group like in just some random Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube. But uh, from what we've put together, that thing has over like 25 million views. Like there's a couple, I think there's over a hundred thousand reactions or uh, comments. Like Mm -hmm. it's just, it's just amazing. Like it, it's funny where you never expect anything to go viral and it did. And so, yeah. So for those that didn't see it, which clearly that's maybe 10 people, according to the metrics you just gave me. Yeah. um, it, it, it was your pops hanging up, just holding up a sign. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was, it was his idea. Cause I guess I would have assumed that maybe you collaborated with him and he's, you should go do this. No, not at all. As, as, as a matter of fact, I all, like I said, all he said is, Hey, can I come to your office with you today? I want to go, I want to go do this thing. And I, I literally, I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? He's like, I just want to go hang out and I want to just wish people a good day. I didn't even know the sign existed until literally like and then i didn't know he wrote shred on it because he was all about like my dad's always been a huge supporter of of, like a supporter of me like my biggest fan we're best friends i didn't know he wrote shred on the bottom of it until i took the picture like i didn't know what his sign like it was really funny is my one of my employees at the time he's just like hey your dad is on this the corner just outside the office holding this sign up and i'm like what does it say and he's like you got to go see so i literally walked down there took a picture and sure enough like I couldn't believe it. And people were honking and waving. And like, it was just, it was, we still, we stood there for probably 30 minutes and just admired the scene. And it was just like, wow. Yeah, sure enough. But it was, I was totally, I did, it was not a marketing ploy. We got a lot of people like, Oh, it was a marketing. I'm like, Nope. I had no idea that it was totally on him. And, uh, 
Yeah, there you go. That's that. Well, that was my intro to you. Like I, I had never seen you before until that video. And and obviously it it had an impact on me. Like I thought it was pretty cool. And then I started sort of following you a little bit. So how long had Shred been around before that moment? About six months. We well, so it was pretty been, brand new. Yeah, it was still relatively new. So uh, we, we had started the company, we started working with, like I said, some of our bigger clients. And, and then at that point, what's funny is we've got a lot of introductions from that. And a lot of people are like, Oh, we saw your dad, you know, and he did, he still does work for shred in a, in a very small way. He actually had a stroke uh, last year. So he's, okay. he's, he, yeah, um, he, he's okay, but he's, he knows like anytime strokes affect people in different ways and he's not the same. Like, and he right. recognizes that uh, there's some of his like cognitive ability that's not there anymore. So he, he has officially retired. Um, every once in a while he'll come into the office and he'll do something fun with us. But other than that, he, he is fully retired now. I bet he would say he was retired before that though. I mean, to get to come into the office and work with his boy, I'm sure he's not considering that work. No, it's not. It's always been like fun and he's always just got to come hang out with us and, uh, yeah, he's, he's that day that he held up the sign was like the day he officially retired. That was like yeah. his retirement. He had been working for the man for, you know, 40 plus years. So that was his official retirement. So it was cool. How did you get into the mortgage space? <laughs> That's like the million dollar question, right? I it's literally was question. Cause you didn't um, go to college to be a mortgage banker. No, not at all. Actually, I was going to U university of Utah to be a doctor, uh, mm -hmm. pre pre-med dropped out. I literally was sitting in, in a cadaver class and was like, I can't do this. Like, I can't do this for the next six, eight years. I'm out. Dropped out of college that day. Uh, went into sales and marketing. And it was doing that for a short time for a medical company. Uh, worked for, yeah, a couple of like just companies here and there. A buddy of mine reached out to me because of something I was doing on social media. I was actually just posting some stuff like, oh, this is fun marketing on, on Facebook before Facebook was even like a big thing. And uh, he messaged me and he said, Hey, you're clearly like, you love creating content. You love doing this. Can you come help us grow our mortgage company? And dude, the only thing I knew about mortgages was I had just bought a house like six months before and I got screwed over by our loan officer, like screwed over, like legitimately she paid us cash outside of our closing. Um, because she's Wait, like, what, oh. what, year, what year was this? This was 2008. Oh, so, perfect timing. Yeah, literally perfect timing. Like 2008, she literally brought us uh, $2,500 in cash because we used her. And then we ended up referring a friend to her. And so she gave us another like thousand bucks outside of clothes. Anyway, nice. um, like, but she's, we found out we got hose. Like she, long story short, we got hose on our interest rate. But that was the only thing I knew about mortgage at that time. And he's like, hey, will you come work with us? Will you help us? Uh, grow our marketing for the for our mortgage company. I said, sure. So I go over there, I meet their, you know, their team. And I see and again, this is 08, 09, kind of things were collapsing, which the I didn't world's know. coming to an end, but you don't know because I you have no been idea. In the industry for 10 or 15. Right. No, Sorry. no idea, dude. So I'm like, Oh, yeah, let's do this, man. Let's, let's rock and roll. And, uh, and I saw these guys and girls on their office making money hand over fist at that time, like just killing it. I'm like, if these idiots can make money doing this, I'm sure I, <laughs> I'm sure I can. So sure enough, you got know, into do you, know, do you know Ken Perry? You know, Ken Perry. Oh yeah. Ken Perry, really good friends. Absolutely. His, his story is kind of similar, right? I mean, yeah. he, he was doing something different for a mortgage company. He was, he was watching the originators make a ton of money. He said, wait a minute, they can do that. I'm I sure I can probably get a piece of that action. So go ahead. I figured you knew Ken. Yeah, Ken and I are super good friends. I love what they're doing with Knowledge Cube. Actually, we're working on some stuff with them with Knowledge Cube too. I was but just I, in Vancouver shooting some videos with them about three weeks ago. Oh, there you go. Like yeah. freaking awesome organization. But so I, I get into the business and I, I start making money and things collapse. But luckily I was able to like, I was so new that I, I was just like, I'm just going to keep doing business. And I thrived actually because I wasn't used to leads. I wasn't used to all that. I was just like, hey, I'm just going to go build my business via you know social media. I'm going to build relationships. And I did. That's exactly like I, people always talk about how hard it was during that time. And we had a lot of, I, I remember those days where companies were open one day and they'd show up to their office and they were just called like closed doors, like crazy on the door. That's right. Le legit. Mm -hmm. So I, I just kept thriving through it. Use social media. Social media has always been my play. Facebook. I got into LinkedIn in the early days and uh, just started building my reputation. I was the outdoor LO. I, as you can see, I love to ski, love to surf, love to be outside. Um, so started building it here in Utah, built a brand as the outdoor LO and uh, just 
shared videos of me hiking, biking, fishing, whatever I was doing, and just connected with people. <laughs> Crazy enough, like I wasn't even talking about mortgages. I was just sharing the stuff I loved and people were connecting with me. So built my business that way. A few years later, ended up partnering with, uh, with another good friend of mine. We built, uh, we built the mortgage company to be one of the top lenders in all of Utah. And then him and I split, like I said, just as I was sh starting Shred Media. So was that integrity first? It was integrity lending. Yeah. Are we, were they, how were you guys set up? Was it broker, banker? Broker. Okay. So you did that for a few years and then do you still originate? Are you still involved? I am still licensed. I say that I'm still licensed. I will always keep an active license uh, just because like, I still refer a lot of people out to our team. Um, like I still, I still do that. And I, I like to be an originator. I enjoyed it, but I do not actively originate. Like I don't, I haven't closed a loan like personally in a while. Um, but yeah, I do still have an active, I mean, license. When you, so you said that there was a day where you talked to an executive or a couple of executives and they said, you know, we'd, we'd love to pull off what it looks like you're pulling off with your own business, but we're not good at it. We don't understand social media. We don't yeah. understand how to make that, that connection through technology and then turn it into a relationship versus it being more of a consumer direct model. Right. Yeah. Um, what, when, when you decided to make the switch and walk away from integrity first, I'm, you know, I'm sure you were making a good income. I'm sure you were successful. It would have been easy to just keep doing what you were doing and be perfectly fine. Was there a trigger moment that was it that people said you can't do it or what, or did you just know that I think this is actually my passion. It's not just originating. It's, it's this niche that maybe the industry was looking for. Like, I'm curious, what was that trigger moment that made you feel like, hey, I'm going to walk away from this thing that I can do with one arm behind my back and I'm going to build a startup? I saw there was a problem I, that nobody had solved yet. You have great, you have great marketing companies. You have great, um, like you've got the housing wires, the NMPs. There was a lot of great companies that that I already knew of that were, you know, doing their, doing their thing, which they're good at, but there was nobody who was actually creating like actual video content, this type right. of like using video in this type of way, people were doing webinars a little bit, but nobody was actually helping with podcasts. You have great people like I, Brian, Brian Stevens and Frank array. Like I watched them, they were doing theirs. Um, David Licken is a very, very close and friend and mentor yep. of mine. He was kind of podcasting, but there, and there were sponsors of shows, but there was nobody who was actually going and creating content. So companies could utilize it, not a sales pitch. We've all, we've all heard those webinars and those sales pitches where it's like, oh, I'm going to be pitched for the next 15, 20 minutes, but nobody was creating like organic, real conversations with companies, sharing the value, sharing their story, actually like crafting a story and telling the, like humanizing a brand, if you will. So I said, well, let's do that. Like, that's exactly, I saw Gary Vaynerchuk and VaynerMedia, like mm -hmm. building that type of model. And I'm like, what if we can build a similar model and niche, like you said, niche really in mortgage. And that's exactly what we did. Just started... Uh, building our own reputation, showing that we could do it. We started doing a, a show every single day and we did 127 episodes straight all from a phone. Um, and we, we didn't miss a single day. We didn't miss a single beat. And then we, uh, since then, I mean, it's been three years now. We rarely miss a day that we, we have a live show. Uh, so yeah, it, that, but it, it started, it wasn't, I, like I said, I love the mortgage industry and there were executives that saying, we're kind of like laughing, like, oh, you can't do that. Like it, th th we had, there are marketing companies, there are advertising companies, but I'm like, I don't want to be that. And actually I had just read the book. This is probably what sparked it more than anything. If you've never read the book, play bigger. Have you ever read the book, play bigger? Nope. One of my favorite books, read play bigger. It talks about becoming a category king. Um, and, or if there's not a category that you kind of classify like marketing or advertising is create your own category. So I created my own category and, and I called the attention and impact is what I call it as we're the number one attention impact agency in the world. We're the only one, but Hey, we're, we are the number one. I just created a category because so many people and, and you've seen this, I'm sure Eric and, and with everything being in this industry, there are plenty of companies that know how to market and they know how to like put you know, cookie cutter content out there, but nobody really was trying to capture the attention of the, or of their audience in an organic real way. And then making sure that content and that attention was making an impact. Like how can you create this type of content? That isn't just, like I said, so salesy. So many of us confuse marketing and sales. Like they're two very, very different things. And our industry is always focused on sales. It's not building a brand. It's not connect really connecting with an audience, building a relationship with an audience. It's always about sales 
sales and sales driven. So yeah, that, that's how shred came to be. And we just started creating content. And we, like I said, we we're just a content machine is really what we are now. I had a back and forth with Todd Duncan a little bit on uh, LinkedIn. I think it was this week or the end of last week. Um, and it was just a comment. He had put something out and I commented that, uh, you know, the best salespeople don't sell the best recruiters don't recruit. I mean, it, it's just, it's just a fact. And he hit me back immediately. And we had a, we had a cool back and forth about it. I think it's exactly what you're saying. I, I, I would guess though, the struggle that you saw from the industry or even individuals was how do I turn what I think I might be good at, which is having a conversation with Josh and leaving that conversation feeling like, I don't know if we're going to do business together, but I like him. And I think he likes me and we're going to stay in touch. How do you, I know how to do that you and I talking right now, right? And getting a feel for who you are and how you communicate. Um, how do you coach people on how to do that through social media though? Because there is a difference, right? There's a difference between picking up the phone and having a conversation or being at an event and walking up to somebody and physically talking to them and, and seeing them versus putting yourself out there via social media. I would assume that's a leap for a lot of people. It's a huge leap for a lot of people. That's why we have our medium. Because I tell people, like, I think everybody should do like you. They should start a start a podcast, like the Walk Podcast. Like, everybody should put themselves out there now in, in that uncomfortable way. Because as you know, as you first start doing it, even if you are that type of person who kind of like, hey, I enjoy this, it's still uncomfortable a little bit. Like doing talking, talking into the camera, hearing yourself all the time. Like there's a little bit of a, that uncomfort that comes with it. But at the same time, that's why we we do what we do is because CEOs, executives, companies, they know they need to be doing it, but it's a lot of work to actually execute, to actually make it happen. So we simplify that process for them through our show and having them on and creating the content for them. But also I love to like you and I are having a conversation now. I tell people like, and I always do a pre-call with everybody. I, a lot of people think I just go into it completely blind. I'm meeting somebody for the first you time. Mean, you mean like I just did? Yeah. 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 Like, but, but, I, like, <laughs> but again, you and I, you and I have done this before. I know. Totally, so like, right. if, and because we do our show live, there's no pre-recorded, like it, no right, like right. editing. It just goes live. Um, I always meet with people before and I'm pretty honest with people. I'm, I kind of gained that reputation in the industry of like, I will tell you if you don't have like that it, and I've been given not to like, this sounds super arrogant, but for whatever reason, I was given the gift and the ability to pull out a pretty good conversation out of most people. I can have a conversation like you and I, you're, you're doing a good job pulling it out of me. Like you have that same gift that I do. Like you can just create an organic conversation, but you, you can pull a really good interview out of 99% of people, even somebody, even people I've met that I'm like, this is going to be awkward. Like this is going to be uh, difficult. Yeah. You can usually pull some like a good 10, 15 minute conversation out of them. Every once in a while, you'll meet somebody where you're like, sorry, like this is just not going to be valuable. This is not going to be a good conversation. And some people are just, I mean, again, like, but I said, that's the rare 1%. Everybody else right. listening to this, like you can, even if you think you're uncomfortable with it, or if you can't, like if it's not your forte or you don't like the way you look, whatever it may be, like forget it, like just do it. Like everybody should be doing this. And so, yeah, to your point, like I just, uh, when I coach, I don't coach. I, I actually forget that word. When I help, when I, no, I don't even consult. I hate consultancies. When I talk an executive through it, when I'm actually discussing with them, if they reach out to us or if, if we have an organization that wants to work with us and we're kind of walking them through it, like I just, I really find out at the at the core, what is it that's holding you back from doing this? And usually is that like just personal fear? Like, mm -hmm. Most companies could do what I do, but they just choose not to because it is difficult. It's time consuming. And a lot of companies actually, my goal with them after the first six or 12 months that we're working with them, I hope they start their own podcast. We've kind of given them that, that momentum. We've given them the content. Now it's up to them to continue like doing their podcast. Some companies stay with us and we've had some companies for years that we work with, which is great, but others, like it finally gives them that little push to go and start creating their own content. You know, what, whether it's hiring a team or, I mean, just hitting the record button. You, you and I have a lot of similarities. The, so we, my partners and I started a recruiting firm. We were doing it pre-2008, but we weren't doing it together. Yeah. My business partner today was at a, um, a very large $60 billion mortgage banker that went bankrupt in 2008, 2009, which Dang. happened to a lot of companies back then. Yeah. Uh, this, was the, this was a big one, though. 
and I had started an external firm. We knew each other because they were a client of mine. And then we eventually pulled our resources and started a, a recruiting firm. But there was a point, I was in a meeting one day, similar to the story you had, where you had executives coming to you saying, well, I sure could use some help with this. We, we had built a process around how we help companies grow. It wasn't just, we're going to go find you somebody, place them, you owe us a fee, and then we go do it again. Like that, that that's not, you can't scale that. There, there's, that, that's not a true business model. So we had built a, a process that we call model matching. And it, it was really like taking the relationship from a lead, like a, even before a prequal, all the way through clear to close and ultimately funding a loan. So we would treat it the same way you treat a loan traveling through the LOS, right? But you, but you have to be able to track it. You have to be able to document it. You have to be able to take a step back and, and say, what could we do better? What could we improve upon? Make sure there's a future action step anyway. But it was static Excel spreadsheets. I mean, is how we were doing it. We weren't tech guys, but we had. I had a. Um, we, we have an argument about where this actually started, where the idea came from. But the way I remember it, one of the ways was that I was in front of a CEO that was a client of ours, actually in Utah, large mortgage banker based out of Utah. You probably guess, um, and that the CEO at that time, who's not there anymore. Had, was sitting in front of me and it was drawing on a piece of paper and he was basically drawing our process. He was scribbling out our process. Hmm. He said, if, if, if I had something like this, what you guys provide for us in a tech pro platform, I pay a ton of money of that for that because it would create efficiencies for me. For, exactly, Josh. So that's where the light bulb went off where you know, two or three of us that don't know anything about software got in front of a whiteboard and, and basically storyboarded this idea. And then we were smart enough to bring in people like Thomas, who's sitting here with me today, and our, our partner, Kirk, who come from the technology space and, and just go build it. Like, why not? To your point, you know, well, why not? Why can't we go do something like this? And then where the podcast came from was really similar as well. And, and Thomas, I think it was, you know, when, when you and I started working together, you can't see Thomas, but he's, he's the producer of it. He's the, he's the producer of a podcast that has no, no offense, but our production is relatively low. Thomas has a full-time job and so do I. So, <laughs> this is his volunteer work. Nice. Um, the, but I'm in that unique position like you to have these consultative, and I agree with you, I don't like the word consult or sales or, or you know, coaching, um, but I get to talk to people like, you know, John Gibson and Phil Shoemaker, and you mentioned David Licken, he was on my podcast, and Sue Woodard, and, you know, people that are running mortgage companies, people that are running technology platforms to support this industry, and one day somebody said, you want to start like a video interview series, because these conversations are kind of cool, and the rest of the industry might be intrigued by where these people came from, not just the seat that they're sitting in right now, but what were the wins and the losses along the way that put them in a position to become who they're, you know, Brian View, who I know you know, is such a great example. And, and I don't know Brian that well, other than he was on the podcast. And I consider him a, a friend, even though I don't see him that often. But, he, you know, here's a guy that was running TPO for Flagstar and could do it with one arm tied behind his back and decided sort of later in his career to go be involved in a startup tech company. Like, what, what are you talking about? And I think it's, I think it's cool for new originators managers, op staff, people outside of the industry to hear those stories because you don't know what's around the next corner, although you won't be able to take advantage of it if you're not paying attention and not willing to hit the start button or the record button, like you said. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's so funny. You mentioned some of those names. Like I was actually texting Phil the other day. Some of these, there's so many incredible stories in our industry. And that's why I started the tread show. The exact same thing is just yep. sharing, sharing valuable conversations. And then like, uh, like I said, it just started to come to like, Hey, we can actually start creating content for people around. We can create content for companies, but it's fun, dude. Like, and you know, this there's, there's so many inspiring stories and people in our industry. And, you know, there's, there's the good, the bad and the ugly, like there is within the industry, but there's a lot of good and like really fun people in our industry. It's, it's, we're blessed to be in the industry that we are. Absolutely. And especially the last several years where the rest of the world has been struggling with things that are beyond their control. I think the industry is about to start struggling with some things that are beyond their control. Also, just market, you know, you, you've been riding this wave of market conditions that you really didn't have any control over. Um, now, all of a sudden, those conditions are changing. You know, how do you ultimately, I was going to say pivot. 
I don't like that word either, but I think I think you've made fun of me for saying pivot before. How, how do you how do you change direction when, when, when the industry is sort of working in a different direction? Hey, I'm curious, Josh. What were you? I mean, you're obviously a high energy guy. You're you're a you're 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 an athlete. Um, you know, I I kind of, I'm getting older, man, but I'd like to still consider myself somewhat athletic. I enjoy doing whatever I can do that's physical. What were you like as a kid? Like, I'm curious what you. I know you went to school to be a doctor, but when you yep. were younger. You know, what did you think you were going to be? What did you think you were going to be doing? Um, dude, I actually, I, I thought I was going to be a doctor. Like from very early on, my dad always like, he pushed me to, to like, hey, go to school, get good grades. Uh, you know, I, had, I, I wasn't the one of those kids who came from hardship. Like I was just your typical kid. Like I grew up in a nice neighborhood, grew up, you know, not having the world, but having like, I had a roof over my head. I had a shirt on my back. I was very fortunate. Uh, but my dad always pushed me like, it was his dream to be a doctor, but it just never happened for him. So he's like, you know, oldest son. He's like, yeah, you're going to be a doctor. So uh, pushed me really hard in school. I was, I was an athlete. I played football. I was big in track, you know, love track. I was, it, believe it or not, I was 280 pounds in high school. I was a really big dude. What um, positions did you play on the football field? Defensive end and right tackle. I played both sides no of the ball. No way. I, was, yeah. I would have said like quarterback or receiver or something like that. No, dude. I was a big, like big dude in high school. I was slow. So when I say track, like, like said, to hit people. I love, yeah, I was all about it, dude. I love playing defensive end. Like I was a fun position. I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, but track, I threw shot put and discus. Like, and I, and I was, I was fairly good at it. Got scholarships right out of high school, going into college. And, and that's what was going to like basically fund my going to medical school was doing mm -hmm. track. And then I just, I lost my, lost my passion for it. Um, I actually created not to die tangent, but I actually lost my passion for track because of my coach. And like, I'm, I'm pretty open about this. My, my senior year, um, unfortunately my junior year, my discus coach passed away. He was, he was the guy that helped me. I was going to state. I was taking, you know, I was doing really, really well in my discus career. He passed away. And then my senior year, my football coach became my discus coach. And this guy didn't know shit about like he had no idea he was a good great football coach so, like i gave him that he was a good football coach but he thought he could come in and coach me as like something he knew nothing about nothing about it and unfortunately my senior year i crumbled going into the, like my senior year you know i was favored to win the state to do like big things and any like it just crumbled for me. And I, I share that story because I tell people as incredible as a coach can be, they can be just as detrimental sure. if, if they don't stay in their lane, if they're not coaching you on the right things. And this coach, like he ended up just tearing me apart. And it was like, it was kind of the end of, I ended up throwing discus for a short time after that, but it ended up dropping in. Like I said, uh, you know, it is what it is after that. Um, but yeah, I, I, as a kid, I was actually really reserved. It's funny. My parents see me doing this now. And like my mom laughs. She's just like, I can't believe like, you know, this is what you do for a living now because I was that I was very shy. I was very nervous. Like my friends do too. Most of the kids know. And I like, I was, I was kind of a jokester. I like to, you know, kind of a class clown, but I didn't like, I never stood out in a, in a very unique way. The first time I actually got on a stage was my junior year. I got asked to MC like one of our talent shows at the school. And I remember I, I literally threw up behind the stage cause I was so nervous. Like I was, I didn't want to do it, but one of our teachers was like, you'll do good at it. And I had fun with it. And, uh, that was like my first time, like, behind the mic having fun with it and it's always been deep inside of me but i remember when i first started doing shows and like i said when i was building my brand on facebook kind of doing this i was like i like this this is kind of fun i can i can create videos i can and I, I i'm that type of guy now i don't care what people think like i mess up all the time people give me shit for my hat i, I think that's actually where a lot where we went viral my first viral video was in an inman conference in new york um, and I got, I don't know if you ever, like if you ever saw that video, that video got buried, uh, I'll have to find it, but it like on YouTube and LinkedIn, it went viral. This old guy, we were filming and I showed up to Inman, New York, which if, you, if you've ever been to Inman, New York yeah. and you, you real estate crowd, you know, it, it is very three piece suit, very like, like very high, very, you know, prestigious. Everybody's like dressed to the nines, very, very big event. And I showed up in a t-shirt and a hat. And this dude walks up to me and he's like, who the hell do you think you are? You irreverent little bastard. And I'm like, what? wait, what? Like, I'm like, you don't even know me, dude. And he's and was like, that, that was caught on video. Yeah, it was caught on video. That was hundred percent caught on video. 
And I, and I, I just responded. I'm like, Hey, I apologize. You feel that way, but I'm going to be me. You're comfortable in your suit. I'm comfortable in this. Who's to say like one of us is right or wrong. And, uh, that's actually, that's, that was one of our most viral videos. And, and he ended up just like, dude, you know, forget you, you need to get out of here. And I'm like, no, like I'm, I'm speaking, dude. <laughs> so, uh, You're on the agenda. yeah. And which was again, that's, so that was kind of my, and thus I, I've always been me. I've ever since then, I've been very comfortable with me, but yeah, as a kid, I had, that was kind of me as a kid. I was a pretty reserved kid though. My mom still laughs to this day that I still do this. So. Do you think this is actually who you are? Or do you think you still think you're that reserved kid? Like when you're away from the camera, when you're away from the industry, do you, are you the guy that will just talk to anybody in the grocery store or are you really not that person? Um, what's funny is like our friends, so if you talk about like Brian view, like Brian view, Kevin Peranio, Ken Perry, those guys know, I love to do it when the camera's on, I, I am high energy, but when I'm just, when I'm sitting back, I'm not the guy who talks. Like I listen a lot, like a lot. And that's uh, a lot of people who know me. And actually, so uh, when shred started, it came from me listening. I was sitting in this room with these executives and I was listening, just kind of being me. Um, and then when I get, when the opportunity presents itself, like I, that's when I turn my energy on and I have fun with it. But no, even when I hang out with like my very close friends, I like it. I like to joke. I like to have fun, but I'm not like, it's not my what's up everybody. Like, this is shred. Like I, I don't, that doesn't happen very often. I, I've never gotten to spend any um, social time with David Licken. I did his podcast. He did my podcast and he's got that voice, right? I mean, he just crushes it on the microphone, but I, I, you know, you always wonder, well, what is someone like, um, away from the mic, away from the camera. I think I'm pretty reserved. Like I'm not the guy that goes out all the time. Um, I'm, I'm pretty laid back and chill, but when, when I'm in at an event or speaking or doing this thing or at work for that matter, I'm a yapper. I, I definitely start, I definitely turn into a, a yapper. <laughs> the idea is kind of free flow and they come out of my mouth and I'm super fine with somebody disagreeing with me and having that fun kind of strategic back and forth. But yeah, I was curious kind of what you were, what you were like there. That's a, that's funny about that group in New York. I remember the first NBA conference I went to, I mean, this is 20 plus years ago, man. It was, I think it was in Chicago. It was back when mortgage bankers were still dressing like bankers. Right. Yeah. And um, I think I came down from my room and I was wearing a suit, but I wasn't wearing a tie. I thought I looked good. And also had not shaved that day, which you can tell. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I, was I didn't shave that day. Like, I, and I don't like shit. It's not good for your skin. So, so I come down and the lady that I reported to literally grabbed me and said, go back upstairs, put on a tie and shave. shave. And I said, if I shave, there's going to be, like, I'm going to be bleeding because I can't shave on back to back days. And um, I came back downstairs with my tie up and little spots of red on my neck. And I, I thought to myself, I can't do this. I can't do this for 20 years. This can't be my career. Um, it was back also when you were taught and, and probably that same thing for lots of people at this conference is, you know, you put your lanyard on and you hang out at the concierge desk and you're like, oh, Josh from Shred, what's up, man? I'm Eric. This is what I do. Like, tell me about your company. And I think I did that once and honestly just was like, I'll just be poor. I just want to go home. I don't, I don't need a job. I'll work <laughs> at the grocery store or something. Um, but kind of that aha moment of maybe, you know, be yourself and, and plug your own sort of personality into it. Um, into dude, as well. what, what, go ahead. No, dude. What's so funny though, is we see companies still do that. Like that's, that's still like an accepted practice in our industry. And I'm not like trying to be a dick by any means, but like nobody likes to go to these events anymore and walks, walk up to your booth and like have somebody like, Hey, like you said, Hey, Eric, I'm just like, you know, you're about to get pitched. You're about to get hard sold on whatever there is. Like we talk about relationships all the time, but like, Oh, with a lot of the client, a lot of people we work with, I'm like, Hey, let's go. Let's, let's create a fun situation. Let's create content around and let's create like organic conversations, provide value to your clients that are actually there. If you're, they're going to be there, have a good conversation with them, share some value. But it's, it's so funny that I, I see an evolution happening in our industry though. I'm starting to see companies more and more as a matter of fact, like, one of the events we went to last year, um, some of our good friends, like uh, I, I won't say the companies, but Ken Perry was one of them. They right. kind of set up an event outside the event. And that was like the most chill, relaxed, like that's where business was happening, dude. Yeah. Cause it was kickbacked and relaxed and everybody was just, you know, it was a good time. 
Do you think part of that is that there's been this tech influence on the industry and the, and the, and the tech industry has a definite, a different culture about it? I mean, certainly very different than a banker. Do you think that's part of it? hundred percent. I think we're starting to see, but what's really, really interesting is more tech, mortgage tech and FinTech. Like there's still a lot of like, and even technology, I, I see a lot more just because I've, this is one of my other passions outside of what I do now is, you know, blockchain and crypto. And I started hanging out with some of those. And those are like, those are like tech geeks. Like those are the ones that are like Silicon Valley, like type people. Um, and they're very like laid back. It is, it is good to start seeing not only like the younger demographic and the younger generation coming into the industry and, and kind of, it's cool to start seeing that it is being more accepted, but even at MBA at this last MBA, you know, I'm very good friends with Bob and very good friends with Marsha and like some of the, uh, the executives within MBA and like I dressing like this, I still have once in a while, somebody will jab me a little bit and just, but, but it's, but it's become accepted and people are, they've, we don't have to, people know from like your first conference, that we don't have to do the suit and tie anymore because that's not the consumer doesn't expect that the consumer's not seeing us at those events. Nobody gives a shit if right. we're dressed up at those events. We got to be us. That's that's when I have my most like my best connections and relationships, and I'm sure you do as well. Do you ever wonder like what you would have been had you grown up doing in this industry, financial services, like in the '80s, when that was 100 percent what what was expected? Right, you were sitting behind a desk in a suit and tie. You went to these conferences, you handed out business cards, and that is the way that it was. And if you were an outlier, I mean, you probably weren't making your way in there. I mean, like I want, we probably wouldn't be doing this, I guess. We'd be doing something else. No, I was going to say, I would totally be doing something else. If I, we, I've joked about this, actually. If I was doing the, you know, banking back in the 80s or back when it was, you know, recognized as like business banking, I probably would have been like one of those vagabond surf bums that just, you know, <laughs> like legitimately, I would have found something I would have been, I probably would have been an entrepreneur and probably would have made surfboards or something like that. But I, I could not have done banking. And even, even when I got in it, like it was still that I remember I wore a, you know, dress pants and a, a shirt and tie for the first four or five years in the industry. And then, and then I finally, I'm like, forget this. I remember. And like you, I remember the first day that I showed up in, in jeans and a t-shirt and my mentor who got me in the business, he's like, dude, what do you like? Did you take the day off or did you stop by? I'm like, no, nah, I'm just going to do business. And he's like, what? I'm sorry. What? And I'm like, dude, nobody's even going to see me. You're the only person seeing me. Nobody gives a Like they're on the phone, dude. Nobody cares. He's like, dress to impress, dress, you know, dress for success. Dude. Dress and I'm like, yeah. Dress for success. I love that. Like, dude, what does no. that mean? That, that, that's hilarious. What do you what do you see is when, when you look on LinkedIn or social media, you know, any, whatever platforms you're looking at, especially when it comes to people in, in this industry, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making with what they put out? And I know I know you've already said one of them is, you know, just the typical sales marketing that, that somebody might put out. But talk a little bit about some of the biggest mistakes you see inconsistency number one like okay be see, specific though when you yeah. say inconsistency like what does that mean like i see somebody that'll make a post and then i won't see another post for them for two three four months like i i see somebody who will make a bunch of posts like all of a sudden i can i know when somebody has signed up for some type of marketing or advertising or some social media company because all of a sudden i'll start seeing a ton of content and i know it's not them and for everybody that's ever hired a media company that starts putting out regular content for you i'm gonna tell you because some people will say and some people challenge me on this but i this is where I, i'm like you I, I will totally like have a have a very respect respectful argument with you about whether or not like is it is put posting content just to post content better than not having content like I'll, I'll argue that to the end of the day and i i say the it is not if you have a company posting content for you there's a very very fine line of when that's beneficial companies like if social coach like i i I'll plug my friend, Joe Wilson. They actually have good organic like content that is valuable. It's not cookie cutter. It's not talking about race. It's not, it's engaging content with your audience. If you hire somebody that comes in and just starts posting like, oh, you know, about mortgage, mortgage, mortgage rates, this program did or da, da, da. And I know too, that when I see marketing like that, it's not somebody from within the industry. It's usually an advertising or a marketing company you hired from outside the industry that they think, but they, they think 
they know what you what your audience wants to see, but they don't. Um, so that's I, the biggest mistake I see is that is somebody hiring somebody because I know they were super inconsistent. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm seeing all kinds of posts from them. If I see you, if I see Eric, like all of a sudden posting videos of him, you took your phone and you started recording videos of just you. I'm like, cool, like, great. Like, uh, I respect, but don't let it stop. Like, you got to keep doing it and set a goal. The problem with, and Eric, I'm sure you've seen this as much as I have, but people will say, okay, I'm going to post once a day because they saw some video of Gary Vaynerchuk or even me. And there's like post content, post content, post content. And they'll go and they'll try to create content for two weeks straight. And they could post one video and they're burnt out already. I mm -hmm. tell everybody like, if you can post one a, once a week and that's like, that's it. And it's just you talking about an experience that you had with a client or even bringing a realtor on or bringing a referral point, whatever it is. If you start with one a week and you can stay consistent with that for six months or a year, then do that. It's way better to do one organic post a week than to do one post a day, burning yourself out or even hiring somebody. So I would say that's, that's one of the biggest issues I see. What, what do you think it? I'm, I'm very interested to see what, what's your thought on it. I, it's the marketing. It's the stuff that's clearly marketing. It's oh things that, that are, that are, that are. And so I think this happens in, in, by the way, I hate the word recruiting. I don't like it. I don't like it for what we do. The reality is, is when, if, if, a, if a mortgage banker says we're at 5 billion and we want to be at 7 billion, or we're expecting a 25% attrition and we want to stay at 5 billion. So we need to have net X to be able to hit that number. And one of the ways that we're growing is that we're, we're, we're sending out emails to the top 50 originators in a given market. And we're going to drip them every 30 days with these emails. I, I can tell you from flat out experience, when, when our services side of our technology platform calls those originators and actually has a live conversation and says, hey, have you ever heard of XYZ company? They're going to say, oh, yeah, I know, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I know those guys. And then we say, well, what do you know about them? They don't really know anything. They just know that they're getting an email every 30 days. To your point, that doesn't create value. It may have something about rates or spring cleaning or we've got a great product and we just rolled out X, Y, or Z. But you don't know me and you don't know what's important to me and you haven't earned the right for me to interact with you through that. I think that's the biggest thing. But I'm also not an expert. Like I, I will be the first to tell you, I feel like I personally don't have, I definitely don't have a level of expertise to coach somebody on how to market or to sound feel like you're not marketing through social media posts, through content. What I did was, and Thomas and I together, we, we created this environment where I get to now cut this up into, you know, I'll get 10 or 15, 30 second clips of you saying something and I'll put it out. You know, I don't know if you saw, but a couple of weeks ago, Sue, Sue Woodard was on yeah. and she had this great story about how she got into the industry because she was essentially fleeing gunfire as a bank teller or something. Yeah. She decides, forget this, I'm going to go be a loan officer. Well, I'm not asking you to subscribe. I'm not asking you to call me to go leave your company. I'm not asking you to call me to sign up for Model Max, the technology platform. I just put out a really cool story of someone who's kind of interesting. Right. And to me, that's, that's, that's easy for me. So that's what I've ultimately done. But yeah, as the expert, I was curious to get your, your, your so, so one of them is consistency. What's the next thing? Are there things that are content related that you see oh, as big mistakes? Absolutely. What you just said, the fact that you and Model Master and your team get that, because so many, and again, this is, we have created this. Our industry is so fixed minded. We are so slow to adapt. We see these big marketing firms. And like I said, I see those cookie cutter posts to this day. I could literally take a screenshot of my LinkedIn right now. And I probably still get two to three like LinkedIn spam messages from recruiters a week. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you have no, you never did any research on me. If you knew you would not try to be trying to recruit me to over to some mortgage company. You know, I have like, I don't even have originator on my, like, you have to actually go and look back in my history of like on my profile to know that I was originating at one time. So it's just so the fact that you have an NMLS ID. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. Like, and they're just spam. Like, and I'm just like, guys, like stop. Like that's, it's, the best way for companies, especially recruit, if you're in any type of recruiting uh, like position, doing what you guys are doing is absolutely brilliant. You're providing value. You're having good conversations because somebody's going to see your interview with Sue and you may not even be in the clip, like, but you may be just the one posing the question, but they're going to see that clip and they're like, man, Eric, like that, that 
that's somebody like I connect with. I connect with Sue. They're going to follow your podcast. going to start ingesting more of your content. And then they get to know you. And then when they do like, you know, when, however, and again, depending on how you guys, your sales and how you guys reach out to people, I'm going to be like, ah, Eric. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I've watched this content. I like, I've seen him. I understand him. I know him. I want to be part of it. And probably more often than not, you have people reaching out to you guys because they just see you. They're like, Hey, you know, I, I'm more, I'm interested in model match. Like I've known what model match has done for a while. Cause it's just, cause I'm familiar with it. I've seen it in the industry. So, but when I was ready to make a change, I'd be like, Hey, I know that these guys are going to find the, like find the right environment for me. You guys know the companies, you know, where it's going to fit me because clearly if you're taking the time to share value with the rest of the world, you can get to know me well enough to say, Hey, this is going to be a good fit for Josh. This is going to be a good fit for, you know, where he wants to do, where he wants to grow. So I, I, that's probably the biggest mistake though, is companies that are just putting out cookie cutter, and again, lenders are still horrible at this that I see time and time again posting about, oh, we just, you know, we just updated our, you know, our FHA program, or we just updated this, or this guideline just got updated. And it's like, great, sure. But mix in some real content with that, mix in some real conversation with that, or how many what I really hate seeing, and like if you guys do this or help your clients do this, I'm sorry, but I like I hate hearing when somebody hired somebody like, hey, we just onboarded Eric. Like, I'm so excited to have Eric on board with us. Like, congratulations. And it's like, okay, like I don't give a damn. And I know it's from a recruiting purposes, like, oh, we just we're bringing out new people, but at the same time, it's like, okay, you you just hired Eric do an, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Eric saying why Eric joined your incredible organization, why he joined your organization. Like, don't just post a picture of him and say like, Hey, welcome aboard, Eric. Like that's, it, I, it's so tacky. Like I, and again, I really hope I'm, uh, it's okay. If I offend somebody, I, I've just, again, I'm just, I'm cool with You're that. Not offending us. We don't, we don't, we, uh, what, I do we do that? that? I think maybe I we've done that about modeling. Tacky. I think when we do it for internal hires though, it, I feel like it's done more to pump up the person that just joined the company versus trying to leverage that, thinking yeah. you're going to get business out of it, which is what I think Josh but is saying. That is exactly. I think, what, I think what Josh is saying too is that um, it's lazy. It translates into being lazy. Being right? Because the, the hard part is doing the interview and saying, hey, let's sit down for 10 minutes. I'm going to record this. Tell me why you joined Bottle Match or tell me why you joined Shred Media. And it's so great. And I'm going to post that. Well, that takes a little bit of time. Whereas it's super lazy just to say, hey, Eric, uh, welcome aboard. And then I feel good about it, right? Because I post it and I'm like, there you go. Eric's happy. I'm happy. Okay, I get to move on now. And I never do anything after that. I post and then I close. I close LinkedIn. Right. I don't go interact with anybody else. Yep. I just post it and then I, I bail. What's so it. funny? Yeah. Thomas, what you're talking about, I literally, and I, I always said, if I started another mortgage company, when I hired somebody, my first thing as like founder, executive CEO, whatever you want to call it, like I would sit down. And of course, like I, I, when I hired people at my mortgage company, you know, we had 50 LOs. I was always part of the hiring process. I love to get to know them. Like you, yeah, like I really like, and I told people, Hey, you probably had a good fit for us. Like, Hey, this is what we're growing here. This, and I, and I actually, I preferred telling people they weren't a good fit because I wanted them to go find what, what, you know, where they really were going to thrive, where they really were going to do good. But if I were to start a mortgage company again, as I was hiring people, I would sit down with them. I would record, like, I would record why they're trying to like, why, where, what are they trying to achieve? What are their goals? And then if they were a good fit for us, I would sit down and I would do a 10 minute interview, 15 minute interview. And I would take that and I would share that. Like, not only is it good for them, but I would also like, that's their kickstart. Cause anybody who ever worked for me again in a mortgage company, I would, you would have to use social media. You would have to build content because I want Eric, I want Eric to build their brand. Like I, if I started the shred mortgage company tomorrow, like I wouldn't want people to focus on shred mortgage. I would want you to focus on Eric's brand, focus on you. People don't give a shit about the mortgage company you work for. Like, sure. and I, and again, people to this day, they, people have no idea what mortgage company I work for, but I still have friends. I have past clients to this day. still text me like, Hey, you looking to refinance? Like it's because of the Josh Pitts brand It's because of, I connected with them years ago and now they still, so that would be my main focus with them. But 
yeah, again, to your guys' point, Eric, you said this is really good. I'm about boosting the morale. If I'm sharing that post, it's purely out of like, hey, I'm really excited to have this person on my team and like boosting, you know, them. But you know what I'm talking, you've seen those totally, posts. When it's, yeah. it's just, it's purely recruiting. We're, they're just trying to boost their own egos and say, well, look like, look at this, we're continuing to grow. And it's like, shut up. It completely lines up with what you just said, though, about how people don't care about the mortgage company. I care about Josh. Josh, I trust you. I'm buying a house. I trust you enough to help me make a good decision about what I'm going to do here. It, the mousetrap might be XYZ mortgage company, but at the end of the day, I trust you. I'm doing business with you. Most mortgage companies would agree with that especially most independent mortgage bankers would agree with that. Certainly some of the bigger banks where there's brand recognition or there's, there's the hub and spoke cross sell opportunities or walk in business or whatever, totally different. That's not what you and I are talking about, but, but those other companies would agree, but here's what's been interesting. Those other companies still do the lazy marketing that you just talked about and they don't back it up with an attempt to build a relationship. So here's, here's a different example. Let's say you do want to post that we just hired XYZ person from, from the competition or whatever. Why aren't we, so we call them validating stories. So a, a, a bullet of your organization might be that you've got a particular product or that your loan flow looks like A to Z or that you're using certain CRM platforms. Those are bullets. Every company does that when they talk about what differentiates me from everybody else. And you and I both know that when you go through those bullets, there are no differentiators. Nobody's hearing the differentiator, but if I can say, hey, you know, it's interesting that you're looking to boost your social media brand. You know, we've just recently partnered in the last year or so with, with Shred Media. This is how we're investing in that platform, but better yet, Thomas Sealbinder, one of our originators, was doing, you know, 18, 20 million a year in volume pretty consistently. Well, in the last 12 months, we pl plugged him in with this platform, and he's doing 25% more business in the same amount of time. Well, yeah. that originator kind of doesn't care about shred media they do but they kind of don't what they care about is that a real person who has the same goal that they have achieved that goal by utilizing this tool that's a validating 100%. story versus different than just plastering with some marketing on a with a brand yeah, dude, that that validating story, how how impactful like you record that and you share it, you use it as content. Like, dude, that's a validating story. That and again, that just represents the type of that you're invested in your employees. Like you really and again, I agree with you. People could care less about the bullet point. People could care less about the shred or the CRM or whatever it is, but people care about like, wow, Eric went from 10 million to 20 million. Like, dude, like getting plugged into the system and this pro, like that's what like, and that's a story too. That's, and again, imagine sharing, like if you're that LO, if you're that originator and you've gone from 20 or from 10 to 20, you've doubled your production, dude, you're freaking over the moon. Like right. that's the person you want to be talking to. That's the person you want to be highlighting because they're, they're just like, yeah, like, like you said, in the same amount of time, I'm doing twice the amount of volume and I'm, I'm loving this. I'm enjoying, it. I'm having fun with like my clients, my consumers. So that, those are the stories that that, that's the most powerful recruiting tool. If, if you, I mean, you're giving away the secret sauce here for recruiters out there. If you're listening, if you're a recruiter, like oh, that's- we, get, we, 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 we give it away. That's why that's how we started the software platform. Any recruiter could use our technology. Any company can use it. They don't need to hire us to do the work for them. But, you know, look, here's the other thing I would say, which is blasphemy as a quote <laughs> recruiter. And that is the, a mortgage company's best recruiters should be their branch managers. It Bingo. should be their regional managers. It should be the team that's already within the, it may be their internal business development team. It should not be an external. And, and look, we, we have a, a software as a solution, right? But then we have a services channel as well. And that services channel will go in and partner with you to help you grow a market inside of the technology so we can collaborate together and you can see what's happening. But sort of like what you described, Josh, which was, we're going to help you build content. We're going to put you on a plan, but I could see the pride in your face when you sort of made the comment of, but there might be a moment where you just go do it yourself. And if I see a year from now that you're, I'm not making any money off of you anymore, but I see that you're crushing it. We win. That's literally how I feel. I, and I, I was very similar with that in my mortgage company. I love when an LO, like they came into our organization, started dominating, and then they felt like the grass was greener somewhere else. I was, I was always one of those, those, you know, people who owned a company of like, Hey, if you think grass is greener, go after it, like get after it. And you would have somebody leave your organization. And then very, very quickly they left because of a paycheck or they left because again, they thought the grass was greener. Then they're calling you back. Like, Hey, 
you know what, what I had there was sweet. I love seeing the success of others. I love, like I said, there's nothing that brings me more joy and then seeing one of our, especially when it's like a big lender or like a big tech company that we've worked with, that we've helped create that content for them, that they say, hey, we're going to we're gonna do this on our own. I'm like, awesome. I, I cannot wait. I will engage with your content. I'll be one of your biggest fans, one of your biggest supporters um, when they go out and start doing it. But the problem is, and I can I can say this, like I've, I've never seen a company stick and stay with it. It's hard. It's hard to create yeah. content. It's hard to do it consistently. Like it, it, if companies did it, <laughs> I'd be out of a job, number one. But number two, like, I, it's just so, it's so foreign and so difficult to actually do on a consistent basis as we've been talking about. And to find, people think it's difficult to create content, but how many ideas, Eric, have you and I given people just on this show, like just talking alone, like talking to your employees, whether you're in recruiting, whether you're an originator, whether you're a lender, like there's so many great opportunities you have to have real conversations with people that are inside your organization that love you, that are singing your praises. That's, that's the best recruiting efforts. I dude, you said this and I hope you branch managers, you area area managers heard it. Recruiting should be like you should not do it externally. And again, not to bash on your guys's business, but you're the best recruiters. Like people are going to ultimately be working with you. If that's true, if you're trying to recruit for your branch, people have got to know you. I tell people all the time, if you're a branch manager, and if you don't have a podcast or some type of show that people can actually see you and you're providing value, you're, you're just another, like you're another, how many hundreds of thousands of recruiters out there. So it's, I think it's also the industry that, that we're in, you know, it, there's instant gratification by doing one more loan mm -hmm. and there's a commission tied to it. Yeah. You don't get instant gratification. Well, you might, I might, because you, you, you enjoy that first step of talking to somebody and that first step of building, getting to know and like and trust someone. But there is an instant gratification in the outcome of actually partnering with someone who then generates volume slash revenue for your branch or for your region or for your company. It takes time, especially when you're when you're looking to partner with people that have already built a book of business and they already have a transferable book of business. They don't need a job. They're already making really good money. So it takes time to build a relationship with them to show them how you and your platform create efficiencies for them and their referral partners, their business partners. How do you trickle that over to those people that ultimately send you loans? You know, the, one of the things that my partner Drew and I got most excited about when we built the software platform model match was that, you know, back in the day we would, you know, I would talk to a group. I, I was out at Kevin Pranio's company last year and, and doing some presentations with them. Um, but back in the day I would present and, it, and that was it. I, and I leave the room. There's nothing to leave you with unless you, you hire me to go do the work for you. Well, number one, you should be doing the work. Number two, I can't scale me. There's only one me. There's only one Thomas. There's only one others. Um, but with the technology platform, now you can take some best practices and you can actually then go do something with it. Right. And so to your point, I, I, I just think that one of the barriers, though, to the content also is that it's easier to just chase one more loan. It's, yeah. it's easier to just get one more commission versus doing something that's going to create a sustainable environment for your business. It, yeah. And I, I mean, going back to your question earlier, like one of the problems that I see, that's just the thing is so many people, even when they first get started, we're so transactional based in this industry. We're always looking for the next loan. We're always looking, looking for the next opportunity. I mean, granted, that's what pays, I like, guess, what keeps food on our tables. That's what keeps a roof over our head. But we are so because from the very beginning, and I was, I, when I was first trained as an LO, it was always about the next deal. It was all, you know, ABC always be closing, looking for the next opportunity, next deal, next deal, next deal. Until I was able to reprogram myself, which was so difficult to really focus on content that was just out there to, and again, like I said, being the outdoor LO, I rarely, every once in a while, and again, only because I read the book, Jab, 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 Right Hook by Gary Vaynerchuk, did I finally understand the concept of like, Hey, give 10 pieces of good, valuable content away and then ask for, or like ask for the business. But I was just like, I was just sharing what I loved. I shared my passion for the world. But when I see originators or executives or somebody in the space to start to create content, and I kind of mentioned this early, but when I first see them start it and the first thing that comes out of their mouth, it mouth is something to produce a new, you know, new opportunities or to fill the pipeline. I'm like, that was it. You had one shot. Like you, you had that one chance to like 
especially as you're starting, if, if the first thing I hear out of your mouth is some type of pitch or some type of like, Hey, use me or Hey, I'm your guy or your gal. It's just like, well, yeah, I unfollow. See you later. Like I, I'm not, I'm not interested. You're and out. That, and, and that, but that's legit. Like I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that as a joke. Like I, I see people still do that because they see people like me and yourself, like doing this and they're like, well, I can go do it too. I'm just going to go tell people that they should be using me. And the first people that that goes out to is like your friends. Like that's what people forget. When you post on social media, especially if you haven't been active for a while, there's a very minute, like of all your followers, there's a very, very fractional piece of people who see that content. And it's your friends and your family and like people who already know I like, can trust you. And the first things out of your mouth in a long time are like, hey, use me. They're like, well, sh never mind. Like, he's not going to post anything. He's not going to share anything that's like fun or valuable to me. I'm just going to be out of here. Yeah, I know. Totally agree. I think the way that I overcome that is that I just get people like you to talk so that I don't have to overthink how to create value for people <laughs> or, or positive content. I just get really good people to talk to. And then I steal all of your clips and stick them up on my, on my platform. That's I'm literally... Thinking. I mean, you were exactly, this is the most I've spoken in a long time. Like, this is That's actually awful. really funny because I, uh, so you can't hear, but I'm like, I have a discord up and my team is on my discord because they listen, they kind of listen to everything we say. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it's funny because they just commented they're like, dude, you are talking so much. Like, and they, they're, they're not even used to me talking. So this is fun, dude. You, That's exactly what it is though. And all you mortgage professionals, everybody listening to this, Eric does such a brilliant job in this show. And what you just said there is you don't have to be the expert of the, like, you don't have to be the main piece of content. I'm not the main piece of content for my clients. Like they are the content. You brought me on the show to be the content. Like you, we think we have to be the experts all the time. When as a matter of fact, like if you're interviewing a realtor partner, let them be the content, let them be the focus. Number one, you're going to make them feel like the bet like the most special person in the world they're gonna be like wow eric is like he's digging on me dude the guy is asking me great questions and he's engaging with me and then we start sharing clips of them and like they start seeing themselves on your social media channels they're like oh, they, they start geeking out like we as humans were like wow God, somebody loves me you really love me and uh but that that's just it like you don't have to be the main fo focus of content. And if you are, share the things that you can actually share content about. If you're talking about business, forget about it. If you can talk about snowboarding, if you can talk about like things that you're passionate about, like that's, that's where you win. Totally agree, man. Hey, look, this was a blast. I'm, oh, uh, I'm going to cut it. Let's do this again, though, at some point. And, and a, a couple things. Well, before we go, is there anything yeah. you want to talk about real quick? Anything you want to get off your chest? No, dude, this was amazing. I want to have you on my show. Like, I think it'd be like, I'm glad we got to meet. I, like I said, I've, I've been a fan from afar. People have mentioned your name, like, Hey, you should have Eric on your show. And I'm like, let's, let's set it up. Let's meet. And then you and I connected. I'd love to have you on the, on our, on the shred show, just adding value. Like we we've done today. There's you've, you do an incredible job and just kudos to you and to the team. This is a labor of love, having a podcast, educating and taking again, like taking time out of our day to share the value that we have not to be arrogant anyway, but I, I really hope people listening to this have got something out of it. I know they have. And what you you are, and your team are doing is so very valuable. You're leading, you're inspiring. So kudos to you and the team, man. Well, I appreciate that. Look, my son goes to college out in Utah. So we, maybe we just time this where I can be out there. I'll do your show live. We'll sit, we'll sit down together. I never Dude, do that. We've got the studio next door fully set up. So you let me know. Where's he go? Does he go to the U? He goes to the UVU. He's in Oregon. Oh, nice. Dude, that's yeah, all I was going to say. He's closer to me then. He's right down the canyon. Like he's he's like 20 minutes from my office. So yeah, next time any you're out excuse, this way. Any excuse to come visit him, I'm uh I'm down. But yeah, let let let's make that happen and okay. then hang out for just a second. We're gonna we're gonna kill the recording. Hang out for just a second. There's something I wanna I wanna uh catch up with you on. Um, but look, Josh Pitts, Shred Media, people already know who you are. This was a blast. These, these conversations are always so much fun. Um if there's anything I can do for you or we can do for you, you just you just holler. But man, thanks for coming on uh, the Walk Podcast. This was a blast. Likewise, man. Appreciate it. All right, bud.